Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another video. Today, we're taking a look at Richard Taylor. So, as I mentioned in yesterday's video, when we were looking at Mortgage Slick, uh, 20th, late 19th, early 20th century Austrian philosopher, uh, Schlick and Taylor, although they, they differ in their details, have a similar view on the meaning of life, which I'm, I'm really calling the subjective view here. So this is a term of my invention, not quite theirs. Um, so Taylor is a, a 20th century American philosopher. Um, so, you know, a little, a little bit later than, than Schlick. So um, Taylor himself was still a fairly young man when Schlick was assassinated. Um, Taylor held uh, positions at a number of places in the United States, um, published on a number of philosophical subjects, uh, including ethics and, and the meaning of life. So this book here, Good and Evil, is the book from which our reading comes. Uh, it's really the last section of this whole book. So it's, you know, the book as a whole is you know, 300 and some pages and the last 15 pages or so is really on, on the meaning of life. So. Um, in fact, the book ends exactly where our reading ends, which is interesting. It's interesting to me, maybe not to you. Um, and one little fun fact about Taylor is that he was also a serious beekeeper. So in addition to his philosophical activities, he wrote uh, a number of books on, on beekeeping, was avid beekeeper, had a, a number of different hives and everything, which that might seem a little beside the point, but uh, I'm, I hope to come back to this at the end uh, because I think it actually speaks to something interesting and it, and it really resonates with what Taylor has to tell us. So just taking a look at a little overview of Taylor, um, really we're just going to get three major points. So first he has a discussion of meaninglessness and what it is for something to be meaningless and we're going to hear him talk about Sisyphus a lot like Camus did. Um, so what, what Taylor thinks to be the usual sense of meaninglessness he outlines, he says, Trying to figure out what, what meaningfulness is, is more difficult than what figuring out what meaninglessness is. Then he outlines two different ways um, that lives can seem to have meaning, and then ultimately argues that it's, it's the subjective account that's the best one, that's, that's the one that makes sense. So um, the two ways it's a subjective object of distinction, a lot like, uh, you know, we, we saw Edwards make this kind of distinction, we see McClunky make this distinction as well. Um, and here again, I'm, I'm not going to sort of fully go over what those other two made of, of that distinction, but keep in mind that even though the same terms might be used, uh, different thinkers can mean different things by it. So this objective-subjective dichotomy can be used to pick out uh, differences. That there's usually a sort of family resemblance to what the subjective or object, objective means. Um, but one thing I will note is that for Taylor, as we're going to see, it's it's the object of view really isn't some view where we um, pull in um, moral values or anything like that. So uh, unlike for the Okay, so let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So as I mentioned, Taylor draws on this myth of Sisyphus as really being the uh, perfect image of meaninglessness, right? Here we have Sisyphus rolling stones, you know, up this, well, this, this rock up this hill, only to have it roll back down, and Sisyphus to roll back up over and over for eternity with, with no point or purpose. There's no stopping point, right? Sisyphus is supposed to be immortal here in the underworld. Um, so it's not like death is going to release him. It's not like there's, there's some ultimate goal he's trying to achieve. And in fact, Taylor plays around with this a little bit. He says, well, look, we can think about that. You know, we, we can uh, give our own sort of version of the myth. And of course, when you're dealing with, with myths, that's largely how they work. You sort of have some kind of theme or there's something going on and you can tweak it and, and give a um, slightly different version of it. He says, so what if, what if uh, Sisyphus was actually rolling the stones up the hill to build a temple, right? This huge elaborate temple to the gods and it was gonna take him a really, really long time and lots and lots of effort. Maybe it was gonna take thousands of years to build this amazing temple. But then once it were done, Right, then Sisyphus's labors would be over. That would be one way to make his work seem meaningful. Um, there's another way, though, 
that his work might seem meaningful. So Taylor sort of outlines these two ways and then really gets into a, evaluating them. Um, his work might seem meaningful or at least less meaningless if he just wanted to roll the stones uphill for Acker. Right? Now, Taylor says, you know, initially this, this approach is gonna seem somewhat unappealing because the way he um, explains it, the, the way he, the version of the myth he gives that has this element to it, is that the gods, you know, want to punish Sisyphus, and so they're gonna make him roll rocks up the hill forever, but then they decided to be merciful for whatever reason, and so they just sort of inject some uh, substance into Sisyphus that then changes his, his psychology and implants this desire to just roll stones up hills forever, right? And as Sisyphus even says, you know, it's a strange and irrational impulse, a compulsive impulse to roll stones, you know, up hills. Uh, it doesn't really make sense, right? Of course, and this is, Taylor's admitting this, right? It's a strange and irrational impulse. It's not like this really makes sense. You know, it's not like Sisyphus sees some sort of point or purpose to rolling stones up the hill. That's just what he wants to do. He just wants to roll stones. So Taylor wants to examine these two ways of thinking about meaningfulness, right? Or, or at least ways in which what Sisyphus does might be less meaningless. So, just thinking a little bit more about meaningfulness versus meaninglessness, right? So to have meaning or to lack it, Taylor, uh, th this is him really describing, and I'll just stick this up here. This is the objective sense of meaningfulness or meaninglessness he's talking about. So he says, meaninglessness is essentially endless pointlessness. And meaningfulness is therefore the opposite. Activity and even long drawn out repetitive activity has a meaning if it has some significant culmination some more or less lasting end that can be considered to have been the direction and purpose of the activity. He continues, but the descriptions of Sisyphus so far also provide something else, namely the suggestion of how an existence that is objectively meaningless in this sense can nevertheless acquire a meaning for him whose existence it is. So one way to have meaning is to have some kind of point or purpose, right? To see activity uh, culminating or, or coming together or really um, uh, achieving some kind of goal, right? having that kind of point or purpose. Right? If somebody says, why are you doing this? You can point to some sort of outcome. Right? Say, well, this is why I do it. Right? Why am I giving this lecture? Right now? Oh, it's part of this course. Right? I'm, I'm giving the course and, um, right, and I can give some explanation of, of why I do that and so on. Or, you know, why are you, if you say you're watching this video and somebody says, oh, why are you watching the video? Well, because I'm taking this course. With, you know, this clown and <laughs> he makes these videos and he puts up online um, talking about the meaning of life, right? And people are like, oh, why are you doing that? Oh, perhaps a good question. Maybe not. We're gonna come around to this uh, uh, next week, at least a little bit, just on Monday, our last class. So we've got this objective sense uh, of, of meaning, right? Having some sort of purpose or point, and this is the kind of thing that is, is sensible and accessible from an outsider's perspective, from an outsider's point of view, right? When we're looking at what other people or what other creatures are doing, we can think about their activity in terms of, of purposes and goals, uh, and we can see that connection between them, right? And in fact, sometimes we can assess the connection between them. If we know that somebody has a particular kind of goal and they're trying to go about achieving it in a certain way, we can actually judge it and say, oh, that's a sensible way to do that. Like, that's an efficient way. That's a good use of resource and so on. Or, no, that's really idiotic. You know, say I'm trying to uh, make a big hole in my backyard, you know, for some good reason, right? I'm, I'm doing a, I did a drainage project last year. I made this big hole and put rocks in it and all, doesn't matter. Um, you know, making that big hole, how did I do it? With a shovel. Right, probably would have even been better to have a, a small mechanical device, some kind of little loader or something to, to dig it out with how much I eventually moved. Um, but certainly, if I was out there with a spoon, right, I'm saying, Yeah, I need to make this big giant hole, right, I'm going to use the spoon to dig it. You could say, Okay, well, I see how what you're doing will accomplish your task, but you're still an idiot, right? <laughs> you know, there are these things called shovels that have been designed for digging uh, that are much more efficient. So, this objective sense is really the view from the inside. This is really what, what Taylor is, is talking about. He's using this objective distinction. It's an outsider's point of view. Um, this is how we look at, at tasks and purposes, right? And of course we can look at our own tasks and purposes from, from the inside, but this is very accessible, 
right? We can uh, make sense of what other people are doing in this fashion. So Taylor thinks about life on Earth and, and really he wants to explore this sense of meaningfulness because he thinks, at least from the get-go, this one seems to be a little bit more promising than that subjective sense, right? Because the subjective sense, uh, Sisyphus is just wanting to roll the rocks, but not for any purpose, not for any goal, right? He just rationally, that's just what he likes to do. Um, Taylor says, that doesn't seem appealing at first glance. It, it seems much more appealing to look at it in terms of purposes or goals, right? Whether or not Sisyphus wants to be doing it. So he says, let's, let's think about life on Earth in terms of this objective point of view, right? And Taylor says, you know, all life on Earth, human life, all life, really resembles the Sisyphean picture of objective meaninglessness. Because really the original myth of Sisyphus is precisely that. It's this, uh, you know, all this work and trouble and toil for no reason, no purpose, right? Here we're using reason in the sense of a purpose or goal. And that's precisely what Sisyphus doesn't have. That's exactly what his situation is designed to be. That's why it's a punishment. And so Taylor says, you know, all life on Earth really looks like this. When we look at it from an outside perspective, and so here again, you know, we get some echoes here of, of Camus and, and probably Nagel, um, you know, Edwards, Klemke, a lot of people, frankly, in this course. When we look at it from an outside point of view, try to sort of step outside of life, you know, imagine we were some, I don't know, just disembodied consciousness that, that didn't have to engage in the activity of staying alive. Uh, what is life really? It's a long series of, of endeavors, projects, struggles, toils, that eventually ends in death, right? And for non-human creatures, and um, Taylor talks about a few different ones. He talks about some interesting glowworms and, and some cave in New Zealand and talks about cicadas and you know, a few different things like that. And, and look, you know, I, I think if you watch a nature documentary, which I highly recommend, by the way, very, I, at least I find, maybe you don't, but worth a try, I'd say. Um, very interesting, right? Uh, seeing all sorts of different creatures on the earth and how they live and, and go about their lives and their sorts of struggles and concerns and so on. Um, how they fit into the bigger picture of things. Uh, when you look at the lives of those non-human creatures, it just doesn't seem like they have potential goals other than survival and procreation, right? Um, a good day for a non-human creature is one where they've got adequate food and shelter, um, aren't sort of worrying about staying alive another day, at least not too much. No, they, they don't seem to be in terribly much danger. Uh, and they've, they've procreated, uh, their offspring are okay, um, or, or perhaps they're in the phase of their life where they don't have any offspring around right now. So it's really just sort of staying alive and then procreating. That's, if we had to pick a goal for non-human creatures, it really seems to be a survival slash procreation. Of course, those two things can come apart depending on, on what the creature is, but that's really it. Taylor says, of course, humans are different, right? We, are, we have projects and, and a uh, sort of conscious life plan the way other creatures don't, at least don't apparently tend to have. Uh, there's also a lot more variability amongst humans. So, you know, look, if you just study human history or just, you know, look around the, the globe or <laughs> you know, look around Lethbridge at people who come from different cultures and, and backgrounds and right, histories and religions and, you know, there is so much variability to humans uh, in terms of, of sort of where we come from, what sorts of, of beings we are. To some extent, I think there are certain underlying similarities, certainly. Uh, and, and definitely in terms of our, our goals, our projects, what interests us. So just in this class, um, the one thing I found very interesting in the, the initial introductory forum was just the great plurality of, of interests and, and sort of life projects um, we had amongst or will still have amongst the various people in the class. I mean, people studying all sorts of different things, people in management, health sciences, um, and on and on and on. Um, people at you know, different stages of life, different, different ages, right? Different backgrounds, different experiences. So there's a great variability amongst humans that certainly sets us apart in some way from other creatures. But Taylor says, if you again take that sort of backward step, you look at us from the outside, despite all of our projects and our, our variability and our planning and so on, uh, really all of our projects as well fall into ruin. And he gives a couple of, I think, 
moving uh, little descriptions of how, how you can see that. He says, you know, go, you know, if you're driving the country and you see a, a, a dilapidated farmstead where there's a, a house and, you know, maybe buildings and everything, that's all kind of fallen into ruin and, um, you know, it's overgrown and, and things have turned to junk. He says, you know, just think about how not very long ago that was somebody's home and, and the kind of um, hub of activity it could be and, and the projects and goals and plans that were being set there and, and the life's, lives that were pursued in that place. And we can come along and, and see it sort of all crumbled and gone. And so, of course, you could do that right here in Alberta. Um, and if you go into, uh, you know, parts of the the world where there is a, um, um, you know, older cities, uh, you can see that kind of archaeological evidence go far back. And of course, we've got archaeological evidence right here about indigenous people living in this area and, and you know, North America for thousands of years. Um, and certainly, you know, if you go to an, an old city like Rome or, or something like that, um, just, just looking down through the layers, um, you can, there's still existing structures from more than, than 2,000 years ago um, that are, are still there. And they were, you know, a hub of activity. And that's where people lived. And that was, that was current. And of course, now it's, it's not. So Taylor says, you know, if we take that, that backward step and we look at us um, along with other sorts of creatures, you see a very similar uh, pattern. Right? He says, this life of the world thus presents itself to our eyes as a vast machine feeding on itself, running on and on forever to nothing. And we are part of that life. To be sure, we are not just the same as other animals, but the differences are not so great as we like to think. Many are merely invented, and none really cancels the kind of meaninglessness that we found in Sisyphus, that we find all around wherever anything lives. So... Taylor says, we're, we're really of a kind with other sorts of creatures. Sure, we have some differences, but really if you take a, a big picture point of view, uh, we're in the same situation. We have projects and plans and, and things like that, maybe more so than other creatures. But uh, much like Sisyphus, it's really not clear where any of our plans or projects or labors really get us. Right? It doesn't seem like there's any eternal stopping place or, or any sort of ultimate end to it. And, and so one thing I will say is that Taylor uh, he, he sort of mentions religion in this vein and says, you know, we often invent this sort of thing, but he says it's, it's his, his view is that it seems very much to be invention, right? Uh, humans invent stories and narratives that provide ultimate purpose and significance and so on. I mean, here we can think of a Craig and Tolstoy and, and the theistic answer, um, and not saying Taylor is right about this, but this seems to be very much, you know, his, his assumption um, sort of running in the background that those are precisely uh, all those sorts of narratives are really created to give us some sense of being different from other creatures around us and and having that kind of uh, purpose and significance that we we do not obviously have in our normal lives right? in fact he says if you look at, at our normal lives and you don't give it that sort of uh, theistic narrative then it seems pretty obvious that we don't have that kind of lasting impact So it seems like objectively, um, life on earth is meaninglessness. They're meaningless, right? Human not. So how could human lives have meaning? Well, um, we've already been, you know, talking about this in, in uh, some way. If there was some kind of point to it, if it produced something like a temple, uh, that would provide some kind of, of meaning to it, right? If it was something that, that sort of lasted even forever, um, that would be one way to think of it. You know, Sisyphus spent all his time, he built this temple, and then it was there for eternity, and he got to live for eternity and sort of enjoy it or, or something like that, right? So we could even do that. We insert, uh, you know, try to remove the, the temporal limitation, right? Our finite lives and our finite projects that all eventually fall into ruin and get overgrown and forgotten and so on. Um, instead, we can say, okay, so what if we were immortal instead, right? We had these projects, and of course, if we were immortal, then we have to think about what our projects and, and goals are like as well, and either they themselves are, are sort of temporal and limited, so we're immortal, but we're constantly engaged in projects that, you know, have some kind of end, 
you know, I go cut the grass and then it's done. Eventually I have to go cut it again. Or, you know, you write a book, right? Taylor writes a book. Uh, once the book is written, well, you can't really write the same book again. So we might have projects that are loaded in that sense, right? Uh, or, uh, you know, and, and projects that only last a certain amount of time. So I cut the grass, but then that activity, the, the fruits of that activity get lost as the grass grows. Um, or we could think about something like the temple that has an everlasting achievement. Right. And Taylor says, well, we could think about that uh, as well, right, a way of providing this kind of objective meaning. But even this isn't going to work because if um, Sisyphus' activity is directed at building this temple, once it's done, right, once he's finished this big project that's supposed to provide this objective meaning to his life, what's the, the end result? Infinite boredom. Taylor says, where before we were presented with the nightmare of eternal and pointless activity, we are now confronted with the hell of its eternal absence. Right? And if you've ever sort of sat around and been bored, right? you don't have something going on, you don't have a, uh, you know, projects or activities or anything to do, that itself is, is often not a desirable state. Right? Some people very much enjoy sitting around doing absolutely nothing. Um, I certainly do, at least sometimes. But the prospect of doing that eternally, just sort of sitting around and never having anything to do, that Taylor thinks looks, looks even worse. So ultimately, Taylor believes that the objective approach to the meaning of life is this approach from the outside, looking at what people are doing um, in terms of, of goals and, and purposes and projects, looking at end directed activity, right? It's not gonna work because either uh, the projects themselves are, are temporally limited, you know, the, the results of them, eventually they're going to be lost or forgotten or whatever, or they're not. And if they're not, uh, well, then there's the question, do you keep doing things or do you just sort of ultimately have some sort of, of end, right? You're, you're completed the ultimate project and now there's nothing to do. Well, that would seem awfully boring. And I'm just going to stick in here as a side note. I, I raised this back when we were talking about immortality as well, because that was, you know, uh, there's certainly echoes here of the, the Fisher and Williams pieces as well. Um, if, you know, whether or not you do believe in some sort of uh, personal immortality, right? The afterlife in that sense, not the sense of Scheffler, um, of, of people continuing to live on, but the sense of personal immortality. There is a very interesting question there about what you conceive that to be like, right? So if it's something like heaven, um, what actually goes on in heaven? I think that's something worth, worth thinking about. What's, what's that like? What would the best state of existence be for creatures like us? Would it involve some kind of uh, change in our psychological makeup, right? Um, if so, is that something we could, could try to pursue or mimic here on Earth, right? Should we? There's a whole package of questions, and of course we can't get into them, and now we might be sort of branching off into theology as well, uh, but I think it's certainly an, an interesting question, right? What, what is heaven like, right? Presumably it's not infinitely boring, right? That doesn't sound very desirable. So what must it be like to avoid that, right? Uh, and what in particular is it about heaven or, or whatever, right, that, that space of existence is for personal immortality? What's it like such that it's always appealing to be there? All right, I'm just gonna sort of stick that off to the side now. It's, it's something worth thinking about, it might be something worth engaging with, uh, right, and I could see some interesting connections here from Taylor back to some of the other pieces we were looking at. Uh, so something to think about, you know, for the forums or, or critical responses or whatnot. Um, but I'll stop there to leave you some room to think and, and explore and commit yourself to something. Uh, so Taylor thinks the objective approach fails. It's just, it's not going to do the trick for us. So this makes that subjective approach more appealing, right? It initially didn't seem that appealing, but Taylor says, given that the objective approach has failed, let's let's try out this, this second road, right? Let's see where this one takes us. If Sisyphus had an irrational desire to be doing just what he found himself doing, rolling, you know, boulders up a hill, Taylor thinks his life would have at least some kind of meaning, right? And our own wills, Right? In, in our own lives, stripping away the mythology and, and all the unusual aspects of Sisyphus' existence, we can have precisely this kind of desire, right? This deep interest in what we find ourselves doing. 
no matter the, the objective point or meaning or purpose of what it is we're doing, because ultimately Taylor thinks this, you know, it, it's not gonna work out, right? Either it's, it's finite and sort of ends in nothing or it's eternal and then ends in boredom. Um, either way, the objective approach just is not going to give our lives meaning. So really the only alternative is the subjective approach. But given that we're decoupling that subjective approach, that, that deep interest in exactly what you're doing, that desire to be doing what you're doing, um, right? that, that kind of engagement, that, that engrossment, we can think about Schlick's play here. Uh, it doesn't matter what the objective point or meaning is, but instead it's just that, that engagement that makes something meaningful. And because it's the engagement that makes it meaningful, not its purpose or point, it really doesn't matter what the activity is. It could be carrying boulders up the hill, it could be carrying little pebbles up the hill, it could be keeping bees, perhaps, right? Um, you know, for, to what ultimate end? None. It's just enjoyable and interesting to keep bees. Right? It, it can be very engrossing and engaging. Now, I'm not a beekeeper, I'm not speaking from experience, but this, this is why I've, I've you know, heard from people who kept bees, right? So those people that do all sorts of other things, right? Uh, who are avid gardeners or sewers or runners or they play sports or, or read, right? Or philosophize or do biology or right, sit margaritas on the beach, whatever it is, right? Whatever you have a deep interest in doing. Uh, and here we can, we can go back to Schlick a little bit, think about play, and of course, Slick has his own particular meaning of play, but I think we can take play in, in the usual sense and think about things like games, right? Sports are a really kind of game, right? Board games or, or video games or right? things that, generally speaking, are admitted to not have some useful objective purpose beyond entertainment, being engrossing, being gripping in some sense, right? Can those sorts of things, can those sorts of experiences give life meaning. I think Taylor and Schlick are on the side of saying yes, for, for similar reasons, but they differ in the details. So Taylor puts it this way. He says, if we have a deep interest in what we find ourselves doing, we find that our lives do indeed still resemble that of Sisyphus, but that the meaningfulness they thus lack is precisely the meaningfulness of infinite boredom. At the same time, the strange meaningfulness they possess is that of the inner compulsion to be doing just what we were put here to do, and to go on doing it forever. This is the nearest we may hope to get to heaven, but the redeeming side of that fact is that we do thereby avoid a genuine hell. Now he's got this phrase here, I want to pause it just for a second, right? The inner compulsion to be doing just what we were put here to do. Now that itself suggests a kind of purposefulness to our existence. Right. And this, you know, as just as a way of speaking, um, we can interpret that phrase, right, doing just what we were put here to do. We can interpret that in two ways. One, we can interpret it with that, that purposeful overtone. I think, generally speaking, a, a religious sort of overtone to it and apply some sort of, of creator, designer who fabricated us in a certain way, perhaps with some, you know, purpose in mind, right? But let's just say, I do not. Um, I, I do not pretend to really know the mind of God or God's plan or anything like that, but let's just for a second put humility aside. Let's say uh, in, in creating me or designing me or whatever kind of phrasing we want, uh, God said, well, Carl, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to make Carl here and I'm going to give him, uh, hopefully, um, fairly good analytical abilities, decent writer, right, intelligent, literate, he's gonna be good with words, hopefully a little entertaining, just a bit, right? Hopefully the odd good joke, even if they're growers. I think they're all growers. Uh, <laughs> something I, I enjoy about this, this video setup is that I get no feedback about my jokes, but I still find them funny. <laughs> so I hope you do too, uh, because otherwise, I'm sure this is torture. <laughs> so, Anyway, um, really though, I, I hope it hasn't been too torturous uh, watching the alter. So, you know, in, in making me, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna give him these, uh, you know, abilities and so on, and really I, I want him to be a philosopher or, or, you know, maybe it's not even quite that precise, maybe it's 
So yeah, you know, he should, he should really be he's sort of academically inclined. He should do something with that. Um, definitely should not be, you know, famous country music singer or dancer or, or fashion model, really model of any sort. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's not what he was cut out for, right? In fact, he's, he's making a mistake if he tries to commit himself to any of those activities. So we can think about that, right? Um, that we're really put here for some sort of purpose. We're designed for something. Presumably, we're put here to do what we're good at, though presumably, right, that, that isn't necessarily the case. We could be made good at certain things, right? Say I'm good at, at philosophy, let's just say. Um, but maybe I'm really supposed to be a country music singer, even though I would be terrible, right? I don't sing well, and, but not, don't look good, right? <laughs> I lack all sorts of qualities you should probably have if you're going to be some famous singer. Um, so there's that, that sense of being put here. But then there's also just using it a little bit more colloquially, um, you know, just, just using it as a phrase, doing what we find really interesting. Um, and of course, we could give a different, different explanations for that rather than being designed for some kind of purpose. Uh, instead, we could give, you know, psychological stories. We can probably give at least someday neurological stories about why we're interested in certain things and not other things, why we're good at some things and not other things, Even biological stories, stories that involve our upbringing and character and, and you know, our parents raised us and our friends and our interests and all this, right? So we can talk about nature and nurture and, and on and on. So even though Taylor there is, is saying, using that phrasing, you know, doing just what we were put here to do, I don't think that really commits him to that first sense of that phrase that he really thinks there's some kind of a plan or purpose that we fit into. Um, though it might, if that's what he meant, then I think we would see Nozick's, Nozick's objection applying here. That even if there were some kind of plan or purpose, that would be something given from the outside, um, which we may or may not then endorse. Klemke had this point as well. So I'll go ahead and, and leave it there. So it's really just this desire to be doing what we're doing, that kind of engagement or engrossment that Taylor's interested in. Um, that's, that's really what he's uh, um, talking about. And from the way he talks about it with Sisyphus and then the way it comes up here again, um, this does not seem rational. It's not something that's really amenable to, to reasons or even just from the way he's phrasing it here, uh, it doesn't seem like the kind of thing you can get wrong. We'll come back to that in a second. So I've got, why not, picture of a kitten, you know, playing with, I don't know, whatever it is kittens play with. Um, just exactly that. I think that's, in some sense, the perfect image of what Taylor's talking about, just being wrapped up in what we're doing. Uh, and just like animals can be, right, humans can be too. And despite our variability, really, when it gets right down to it, it's about being, being gross, about just sort of doing what is appealing, what's, what's engaging to us, whatever that might be, right? whether it's playing with whatever the kitten's playing with or creating philosophy lectures on YouTube. Okay, end of the home stretch here. Uh, so if we look at goals and, and projects from that objective point of view, from that, that outside point of view, um, they all might seem sort of pointless, meaningless, um, fruitless from the outside precisely because eventually they're achieved and forgotten, right? They, they, they always run out in some sense. And if they didn't, if they were some kind of eternal accomplishment, even that would ultimately just lead to a kind of boredom and, and wouldn't really um, do the trick, tailor things. But it doesn't seem like that for the people engaged in those projects or, or goal pursuits at the time. So returning to that image of the, the you know, farmhouse that's, you know, run down and overgrown and everything, or, um, you know, old structures, right? Whether we go to Rome or, or Paris or something, or, you know, Jerusalem, some ancient city where we can, dig down and see layers and layers of, of um, building and so on. Or we look around here, you know, North America or South America, we look at uh, indigenous peoples and, and look at the, the records of what they've done, right? Whether it be the oral traditions, hearing about things that they've accomplished or looking through the archeological record and so on. Um, we see all these, th these lives from the past that are now in some sense dead and gone and they sort of echo for us now, right, we see these, these remnants, we've got something from them. Um, but of course, we're still 
living our lives. And so our goals and projects are going to be very similar to those of other people who are eventually, you know, dead and sort of forgotten and, and or at least um, you know, collect dust in some sense. But that doesn't change the fact that as we live our life, um, we, we are engaged in it. So ultimately, it's really looking at life from within. It's, it's the subjective point of view. That's the right one to look at the meaning of life from. The whole justification and meaning of an activity comes from the desire to pursue it. And I've put non-rational here just in parentheses. I had irrational before Taylor talks, so I'm going to go irrational. Um, just a, a note on that. Taylor doesn't quite put it this way, but I'm, I'm going to put some words in his mouth uh, on this. It seems like the meaning of life, the way Taylor's describing it here, and feel free to disagree with me if you think I'm reading it wrong. Uh, Meaning of life is really purely subjective. Whether or not your life is meaningful really depends on whether or not you engage in those things that you just find gripping and engaging and interesting. It also makes the meaning of life seem encourageable. It's not the kind of thing that you can correct. It's not the kind of thing somebody can get wrong. So if you know, somebody wants to just spend their lives playing games versus working hard or you know, finding a cure for cancer or whatever it is, the meaning of life according to Taylor's account, does not come from any kind of, of goal to be reached or uh, objective value or, or anything seen from without. It's all about how the person sort of views what they're doing themselves, right? how it seems to them. Uh, it fits. And, and one thing he doesn't quite talk about is precisely how we're supposed to measure this across a life. So he talks about being engaged and engrossed in certain sorts of activities, right? And I can certainly think about this when I'm gripped with, uh, you know, philosophy or just like a game that's very um, gripping, right? I, I find this. I mean, guess what? I play video games. I'm, you know, I do fun things that aren't just philosophy. I know, crazy. Um, you know, I can get totally sucked right in, right? Just totally engaged. That's all I want to be doing, right? I just like rest of the world, just leave me alone. I need to you know, finish this article or read this book or, you know, build that virtual empire. That doesn't really matter because it's just lines of code, but it's, it, it's got me going, right? It's, it's absorbed me somehow. Um, how do we measure whole lives? So if we're thinking about the meaning of life, right? If that's really our question here, Taylor's really told us about meaningful activities, or at least this is what it seemed like. How do we gauge an entire life like that? I think this is a question that applies nicely back to Schlick as well. Is it a like 51% kind of thing? If 51% of the time you engaged in, in activities that were really gripping and absorbing and so on, then your life was meaningful. Is it that at least some of the time you did that, right? Um, does that have to be more than, than 51%? It, you know, oh, the, the vast bulk of your time you're doing things you really loved? You know, if that, that's what it is. That seems like a pretty hard bar. Uh, a lot of life is you know, maybe not exactly boring, but, but full of things we don't necessarily want to be doing. And this is where Stuck, I think, comes back into the picture a little bit, because he's pretty explicit about trying to bring in um, the structural features of our, our societies, right? And say, look, what, what are we really doing, right? Why is it that we spend so much of our life doing boring things we don't really want to do? Oh, because we need the GDP to go up, right? For what purpose? Um, if we're sucking the meaning out of people's lives, for the sake of, of more money or something, unless that more money results in more meaning or better lives somehow, then it seems like the, the whole project, the whole enterprise is upside down. And we're valuing the wrong things. So um, I, I think there are these very interesting questions, right? If we, if we think what Schlick and Taylor are telling us are interesting to some degree, if they seem plausible, if there's something appealing about them, I think there is this, still this open question about how exactly do we determine whether or not whole lives are meaningful, if that's even uh, uh, worth, worth considering. Uh, this is also a question I think in some sense retroactively applies to some of the other people we've been looking at. Right? We certainly hear about how certain parts of lives are meaningful or not. What about lives as a whole? And I think some of our, our thinkers have given us uh, more information on thinking about life as a whole than others. So here, you know, just thinking back to some of the theists, uh, if really what we're looking for is something like eternal life or eternal, uh, you know, significance or something like that, 
then it, it seems in some sense a little bit more clear how we judge the life as a whole because we're judging it from God's eye point of view or eternity or something like that. But if it's, you know, we're trying to stick with a, a sort of secular, particularly individual subjective point of view here, um, are, are we expecting individuals to judge the meaningfulness of their own lives? If so, at what point or points, right? Is it sort of a deathbed thing? Like, you know, only on your deathbed can you really judge whether or not your life was meaningful. Or can it change, right? If right now I, I judge that my life as a whole has been meaningful up until this point, given the sets of experiences I've had and so on, and then just tomorrow I'm, I'm gripped by kind of a funky mood and I feel a little depressed for some reason, uh, and I just tomorrow judge, oh, my life really hasn't been meaningful, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or if in five years or 10 years or 20 years, right? What if our subjective evaluation of our, li our lives as a whole and their meaning changes, right? At what point do we fix the evaluation? We say, okay, you should take what Carl or whoever's evaluation of their life was seriously at on their deathbed or here or wherever, right? But not at other points, right? What do we count as the correct judgment versus the incorrect judgment, assuming that they might change, right? Uh, and of course, there's still this open question about whether or not people can, in some sense, get the whether or not their own lives are meaningful wrong. And this was something that Edwards was allowing for, though we didn't quite hear, uh, I, th I think, a full account, right? Edwards was hinting in this direction as he responded to the pessimists, but didn't really sort of give us a, a full sense of how we might do that, other than thinking about how the world is a better or worse place on the whole for having somebody have lived their life. This is exactly what we're going to get into in our next two thinkers this week, Keeks and Wolf. Uh, they're going to get their hands a little bit dirty, so to speak, in thinking about a more um, objective view of life, one that takes the subjective insight into account, this, this engagement, this desire to do what we're doing, but then says, we need something more than that. It can't just be that, right? Lives can in fact have um, um, subjective meaning and some kind of objective meaning as well. There's, there's both the view from within and from without, and we need to strike the right balance of those. So uh, that's where we're headed. Um, tomorrow and, and the day after. Just before we get there though, I just want to close with uh, really the, the last words of Taylor's piece, which are also the last words of his, his book, uh, Good and Evil. It says, a human being no sooner draws his first, first breath than he responds to the will that is in him to live. He no more asks whether it would be worthwhile or whether anything of significance will come of it than the worms and the birds. The point of his living is simply to be living in the manner that it is in his nature to be living. He goes through his life building his castles, each of these beginning to fade into time as the next is begun. The same will be the life of his children and of theirs. And if the philosopher is apt to see in this a pattern similar to the unending cycles of the existence of Sisyphus and to despair, then it is indeed because the meaning and point he is seeking is not there but mercifully so. The meaning of life is from within us. It is not bestowed from without, and it far exceeds in both its beauty and permanence any heaven of which men have ever dreamed or yearned for. Now, whether or not Taylor is correct, I leave for you to ultimately assess, but that brings me to the end of my remarks on his piece uh, and closes our look at this point of this, what I'm calling subjective view of life shared by Schlick and Taylor. Next day, we'll be back taking a look at Keeks, and then we'll be moving on to Wolf on Thursday. I hope you're having a good day. You'll see me tomorrow. Until then, bye for now.